All right, Mark, thanks for taking the time to do this. It's really an honor to have the opportunity. Oh, thank you, Jesse. Um, before we get started, um, I'd like to again offer my condolences on the passing of your co-founder, Clay Christensen. He's obviously been a huge inspiration for me throughout the years, so um, I can only imagine how that's impacted you and everyone else for doing well. Uh, <clears throat> yes, thank you. you know, it's, uh, it's a big loss uh, for him to uh, passed away. Um, there's a lot of uh, reflection about uh, <clears throat> all the contribution he's made uh, to so many people, uh, to me personally, you know, not just professionally. And uh, all I can say is, uh, you know, where I'm left after a month of his passing is, uh, or more than that, I guess, is uh, mm -hmm. just deep gratitude for uh, just the kind of human being he was and uh, his intellects and his his generosity and kindness uh, have uh, have just uh, been amazing, and you know we hope to continue on in his legacy and what we do at uh, at Insight. Yeah, certainly, and I think like uh, the great thing about it is that that he was able to uh, put a lot of his thoughts in in writing and really help a lot of people throughout the years. So I'm sure his legacy will will live on uh, stronger than than ever. So. Let's, yeah, let's do our best I, to honor that. Absolutely. So um, before we get started, I'm sure most of the people in our audience have a pretty good idea of who you are, but could you please give a quick recap for those who aren't yet familiar with you or your work? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so again, I, uh, I'm Mark Johnson, and I co-founded InnoSight, uh, which is a strategy and innovation a consulting firm that I co-founded with Clay Christensen about 20 years ago. Um, you know, we started based on his work of the innovator's dilemma and disruptive innovation, you know, focused on helping companies not only deal with the threat of disruptive technologies and innovation, but, you know, how to turn it into an opportunity for new growth. And over these 20 years, we've evolved to not just think about innovation and breakthrough and disruptive innovation, but also, how does it connect to strategy and long-term strategy, which is needed, you know, oftentimes for the development of new and different products and services. And uh, we continue to evolve and work not just in innovation and strategy, but integrated also with leadership and the importance for how leaders need to behave at the top to be able to, to drive breakthrough growth in support of innovation teams. And, you know, when we put that all together, the disciplines of innovation, strategy, and leadership, we we, we focus with our companies that we help and, and other institutions, not just for-profit companies, and um, in uh, how they can own the next version of themselves, you know, how they can own the future and uh, be able to, to navigate, especially in the times that we live. So that's a... Uh, I mean, like I said, we've been at it for about 20 years, and, uh, and uh, we've covered a gamut of industries. So we haven't really focused on one particular, but uh, but we have focused on this idea now of you know really trying to help companies transform, help them to navigate the future, and to continue to drive top line growth. Sounds great, and I think like you're really spot on in in the ability to combine. Uh, both the uh, the kind of like uh, strategy and leadership uh, aspects with innovation. Yeah, you know, I, we find so often, Jesse. You know, the 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 innovation the, the, the innovation teams get st stood up, and everybody's passionate about innovation and hire a chief innovation officer, and and yet you don't necessarily oftentimes you don't see behavioral change at the top with the senior leadership team, and they need to be partners with. With innovation team efforts, and you know, well, I'm sure we'll talk about that. But that's a that's a key part of this is how do you get the leadership teams to be more innovative and more learning based, um, since they ultimately are the ones that are going to allocate the resources. So if they're not on board, it's not going to happen. Absolutely, yeah. I think that's actually a great segue. So um, you have a new book coming out soon called "Lead from the Future: How to Turn Visionary Thinking into Breakthrough Growth." Um, so could you share um, what, what it's about? Sure. So, I mean, the, the main idea of the book is, is that I think 
so many organizations and not just businesses. And we talk about government, uh, nonprofits, even religious institutions, but so many organizations, uh, including large corporations, um, they're very good at, at planning, you know, they're planning in the, what we would call, you know, the short term, relatively speaking, um, budgeting and they're, they're driving forecasting, you know, but I think it's forecasting off of the core business. So they're good up to the three year, maybe even four year uh, horizon. But beyond that, you know, going into the real longer term, not so good and, and really not interested. And, and we make an argument that says, if you really want to sustain the kind of growth that, um, you know, not only drives shareholder value, but, but drives real purpose and motivation of the organization. I, you have to both plan for the short term and the long term. And in and the way that that long term has meaning um, is vision and, you know, going past a vision statement. And then that's done by being able to think in a different way that we call future back. So in a nutshell, you know, really what the book's about is being able to embrace the long term and the short term uh, through both a way of thinking and a process we call future back. Um, and, you know, that's, that I guess is in a nutshell what the book is about. And we try to do it both from a high level inspirational side of things, but also try to get practical about how would you actually move through a process to be able to understand the future and do something about it. Yeah, absolutely. Could you um, tell us a little bit about how you developed the approach uh, that you talk about in the book? Sure. Yeah, well, you know, it kind of goes back a little bit to the, the story of, uh, of who I am and Innosite. You know, we started in this innovation space, you know, and it was disruptive innovation. And then what's mm -hmm. really the underpinning of disruption is business model innovation. So often the disruptions in the business model, right? Not in the technology. Um, and so how do you get good about business model innovation? In fact, I wrote uh, a Harvard Business Review article called Reinventing Your Business Model. Um, and then a book called Season the White Space and a follow-on book called Reinvent Your Business Model. And, and so, you know, we kind of focused on business model innovation uh, amongst others and realized so often that these business model efforts weren't um, being successful. They weren't coming to fruition. And that got us into the recognition that without a strategy that could encompass the longer term process to incubate and accelerate new business models, uh, they weren't going to be successful. And so that got us into strategy and realizing that the nature of the strategy making process had to be much more learning based, more entrepreneurial, similar to the development of uh, that an innovation team would do with new business models. So mm -hmm. that that got us into developing, um, you know, a way of thinking in this process called Futureback um, as the as the means to overlay on sort of these innovation efforts, and then and then the leadership piece became the getting the leadership teams engaged in the right way of this strategic or st strategic planning process to be able to support breakthrough innovation. So. Long story short is, you know, this has developed over really almost 20 years. You know, it started with understanding innovation and breakthrough innovation, you know, and yeah. classic disruptive innovation. And that led to the, the need for strategy and strategy making. And that further evolved to the importance of vision as part of that and, and, and vision as imbued by, by leadership teams and, you know, putting all those together as what we describe in the book. Um, it's the holistic part of it, I think, that makes it essential. You know, without the strategy connected to the innovation and the leadership teams participating heavily in the strategy, we find that really companies trying to get beyond their core business are going to struggle um, unless they integrate these things together. Absolutely. And uh, I've had the opportunity to read the book and uh, I can certainly say that I I really appreciate the holistic view that you've taken there. And, and I think like like you mentioned, um, these kinds of larger transformations and innovations 
absolutely take more than a couple of years to implement. So uh, if the planning is just limited to a few years, then uh, nothing will happen. If you had to pick one thing, what's the message you'd like a reader to walk away with after they, they're done with the book? Um, you know, <clears throat> maybe I, I put it into two messages. Um, one is that, you know, I think, I think there's a lot of, um, how should we put it, uh, suspicion or skepticism about the idea of thinking five to ten years out. I mean, I think it's, um, you know, I think it's viewed as, well, it's a fool's errand, um, uh, you know, how with all the noise and the complexity about today and how fast things are changing even in the next couple of years, how could you even be looking out past two years, let alone five to 10? And, and I'm just here to tell you, you know, having done this many times with, um, you know, with clients, uh, with companies and other institutions that, that thinking out into the future and forming a vision and converting that to strategy and walking it back to inform better the kinds of seeds that you would plant today for the future, not just continuing to drive the core, which of course is essential, is eminently doable. Um, and that there is a way to take and bring the future and make it and learn from it and, and embrace it and be able to shape it. And, and that it's not some kind of, um, you know, again, some kind of fool's errand that it is actually manageable and it should be part of management. And in fact, it's more important than ever. The, the more complicated, the crazier things get, the faster things move, the more it's important to set aside time to, to, to look into the future and spend time in it. So I think that, that I guess that would be the main takeaway. Um, and the secondary one is that in order to do that and to, to actually make it happen, we have to change the way we as leaders and managers think um, because we're so consumed with so many things on our, on our plates that we only think in a more execute and operate way, even in innovation. I think leaders especially still are really working through product development and other kinds of innovation efforts in an execute operate way. And, we have to step back and be more learning and explore and envision, discover oriented to, uh, we have to think in this different way if we're going to bring the future alive. And that I think is what I would hope to, to give readers is, is to be able to, uh, to recognize that, that, that that's the big insight over these last 20 years is the, uh, this importance of the five to 10 year horizon and how to bring it alive. Thanks. Moving on, um, if we like go back um, in some of the experience that you have from working with your clients, um, where do you see most companies struggling on the axis from like vision to execution? Now that you have this like more holistic approach of guiding them through it, um, like are there any common patterns, or is it always dependent on the situation? Um, well, you know, I, I would say the the one area where it's almost universally a struggle um, is the notion that um, going from vision to strategy in the case of doing something that's pretty transformative for the organization, uh, going and trying to do that, you, you know, immediately to execution without, really, as I talk about in the book, programming the strategy, you know, programming what was first started as vision and being able to really set up the right governance structure and the right process and the right <clears throat> kind of team structure to be able to embark on initiatives in the right way. I almost always see, we almost always see that being a breakdown where, where companies are too anxious to kind of go and say, oh, we've got this inspiring vision and strategy and how we're going to do things. And then um, they just say, well, we're really good at execution. So we'll go and execute it in a similar way that they think that they execute on a, on a product in a manufacturing line or, you know, in, in a sales force and so forth. So I think I would say both as another important insight to take 
away from a, you know, what we write about, but also um, what, to your point, constantly breaks down is, is this need to create this bridge from an inspiring vision and strategy uh, to executing. You have to have this in-between step of programming the strategy and really spending the time to to set up the organization and the governance and the in the process and the structure in the right way i think that's probably the number one um sort of part of it that breaks down or or where companies to your point struggle yeah, um, yeah. in this vision to execution process yeah if, if we uh like dig in a little deeper there um how do you th- suggest um, a company approach uh, creating these programs and building those bridges? Um, are there any like general good practices that you'd recommend they they take? Absolutely. Which you know we we talk about it as um, is understanding that you're developing a system approach to execute. That it's it's not one thing, and and as we talk about in the book, we don't give a very, you know, specific, you got to do this, this, and this. We say these are almost like ingredients to a, as part of a recipe. Um, But we, what we try to do is give the main ingredients, which is that again, thinking holistically as part of programming that um, as I mentioned before, it's very important in addition to the innovation team that the leadership team be engaged in the right way. So their role is to set proper governance, which means that they're overseeing um, major innovation efforts and they're intimately involved, um, that they are part of the process to help sponsor and, um, and support the efforts along the way. The other role of a senior leadership team is, you know, setting up what we call a transformation management office, that there is actually, you know, some ongoing um, work in terms of being able to coordinate and manage, if you will, a work plan of -hmm. of these initiatives. And then the other, and that kind of ties to having overall master plan and funding. So they really have to kind of set up that piece. So that's one part of program. And then the other and that's on the leadership team, senior leadership team. The other is how do you set up the organizational model for the innovation teams? That's a little bit more um, uh, covered in other books. I mean, a little bit more familiar, I think, to innovation efforts, but things like, you know, how do you set up the right incubator for for something that's going to require a business model innovation effort? What do the teams look like, the venture teams, and, and what's the nature of the talent that needs to go on there? So, in a nutshell, you know, the programming piece needs to have the role of the senior leadership team. It needs to be the right organizational model for the innovation teams. And then, and then finally, what they both shepherd, the innovation team and the leadership team, is a, is a process that is um, not even like a stage gate product development process, right? It needs to be much more of a learn and discover, uh, exploring, envisioning, being able to test and learn approach. So they have to be uh, part of the programming, setting setting up the right kind of learning process for these teams and for the leadership, for the innovation team and the leadership team. And so those are the ingredients, if you will, in terms of how it actually gets prescribed. It, it definitely varies depending on the company. But, but that programming piece is what enables the leadership team and the innovation team to rally behind and support each other around a process that's going to see these breakthrough initiatives through in the right way over time. I think that's a, a great uh, um, what way to put it. The role of the leadership is not just to kind of like be a spokesperson for, for innovation, um, but they also really have to actively um, work to have the right governance and programming in place. So my next question was also um, on leadership teams. Um, So in addition to having these um, structures in place, um, are there any specific traits or or, um, patterns that you see um, the best leadership teams have? 
No, absolutely. I mean, you know, and as, as we talk about so much of this of being looking forward as opposed to today or looking back, you know, where if you're looking back or looking today, you can rely on data and, you know, analysis, but, but oftentimes when you're moving forward, you know, with data being in a reflection of the past, you have to be more oriented around assumptions um, uh, and, and being able to, as a leadership team, work around assumptions as opposed to just data and facts uh, requires a, a ability to um, embrace the abstract and some ambiguity. It requires a humility to be willing to uh, be open to divergent point of views and to learn from others. Um, you know, we like to say that uh, learning is on the other side of innovation, um, mm. and then humility is on the other side of learning. And um, so, we find the best leadership teams are those that, that can come together and 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 talk about uh, these issues, realizing that the sum of them is greater than the the individual pieces that come together is, you know, makes up a greater body than. Um, just one individual, uh, needless to say, um, and they work in a very collaborative way and they're willing to diverge before they converge. Um, it's that ability to learn from each other, to be open to subject matter experts, to be able to mm -hmm. wrestle and iterate that that creates success in a team. And, it, and by the way, it doesn't mean obviously that they're doing it even the majority of their time there, but when they, when they are looking toward the future and they are looking toward innovation teams that are working on new and different times of efforts that they are willing to step back and, and enter into this space of learning. You know, I think a great example of being able to drive, uh, you know, sort of a next uh, version of yourself and, and, and sort of get to the next stage is what uh, CEO Satya Nadella did at Microsoft when uh, mm. basically it wasn't long into his um, tenure that um, his wife inspired him with, uh, with a book, um, which basically helped him realize that they had become a culture of know-it-alls and they needed to become a culture of learn-it-alls. And it was really inspiring the organization to be much more open to learning and being a learning organization that in large measure was able to help you know, move Microsoft to the next level under his leadership. And I think that's a, sort of a great example of um, what I think is so important uh, for leadership teams in, in the age that we live is to have the ability, not all the time, but again, a portion of their time to be very open to explore and envision, discover, to, to engage in a learning process that's probably going to be a little less comfortable for them, but mm -hmm. it's going to allow them to generate insights they wouldn't, uh, wouldn't have if they didn't go through that, that kind of learning effort. Absolutely, yeah. Um, many of our... Uh the listeners are in a position where they are uh, maybe in one of those uh, programs within the organization or in those accelerators or, or labs or innovation teams where they don't really have much of a say in the actual vision or the strategy of the organization, um, but they're still tasked with making innovation happen or creating the future in, in whatever organizational sandbox they happen to be in, um, which often leaves them a bit frustrated or confused depending on the situation. Um, so is there any advice you could give these people on, on what they should try to do in practice and, and how they can perhaps uh, manage up towards um, their, their leaders? Yeah, no, I mean, that's a, that's a great uh, question. And, and I've seen it myself, you know, in actually helping um, folks that are working in innovation teams and, you know, if the senior leaders are doing something different or they don't get it, um, that makes it really hard. And if they don't get it at all and they don't want to get it ever, then I don't really have much advice that I could give. At some point, I think it's just going to become 
it's going to continually be frustrating. And at some point it maybe it's going to be untenable, but, but what I could say though, is for many organizations where maybe the leadership team isn't quite there to, uh, in terms of having developed the right vision or strategy or being very inspirational is, um, is being able to get them to, to start with the language, you know, such as uh, what we've tried to do in the book with lead from the future, that there's a way of thinking called future back versus a way of thinking traditionally present forward, you know, taking the present and moving it forward having an opportunity to be able to just share in a language um, with with the folks that are your leaders um, and, and encourage seeing if you can influence in that way oftentimes can be pretty powerful. I know when Clay Christensen came out with the innovator's dilemma, mm. um, its interest was was marshaled or was generated within Intel Corporation at a middle manager level um, and got them very excited and concerned about what they were doing in terms of their innovation efforts and microprocessors. And it ultimately uh, reached the desk of the CEO then, Andy Grove. They influenced Andy Grove, um, who then read Innovator's Dilemma and then started to uh, started to realize it clicked for him as to what potentially could happen to Intel. And then that led to something that was generated bottom up to be all of a sudden moved in a much more top down way. So, so I think the question is how can you give uh, your boss or, or senior leaders above you a common language? And um, if they're open to, to reading um, or hearing about uh, a different way of thinking, um, then that's a great start because then that language hopefully then moves to action. Um, and, and like I said, absent their openness to, to talk about a <laughs> different language, um, you know, I think it might be very hard to, uh, very hard to sustain in that business, especially if you're passionate about innovation and doing things in a different way. Absolutely. Language is really a powerful tool in trying to shift the mindset. And if you're able to use language to clearly communicate the difference between what you're doing now and where you see that the, that you should be going in the future. Absolutely. Um, the last couple of weeks have been obviously quite eventful around the world. Uh, and uh, obviously the recent uh, events with coronavirus and everything else going on at the moment um, we're seeing a lot of different challenges and opportunities uh, around the world. Are there any uh, like specific opportunities or challenges that you're personally most excited about at the moment where you see that uh, like innovation could really uh, help make a difference? Well, you know, uh, I, I can't help but be overtaken, like I think so many of us are <laughs> around the entire world, to your point, Jesse, about the coronavirus. And you know, it is an incredible, uh, it is an incredible challenge, um, you know, and it's pretty scary. And I don't think we've ever experienced anything like how disruptive this is to our lives just in a day to day. And, you know, what's happening with economies around the world and, and, and just a lot of uncertainty going forward. And I, and I would argue for so many countries and, and individuals, it's been a very present forward type of response and 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 not to criticize that because we are in a crisis but i think it also lends the opportunity to um to to recognize that uh you know especially with how disruptive this has been we need to prepare for there to be potentially a next pandemic and maybe it happens sooner rather than later so you know how would you how would you future back another one um, and, and actually have more thinking about, you know, what's the ultimate outcome that you want um, and how you would work backwards to the kinds of things you would have prepared today and that you would stage in a more prescribed way than the sort of reactive nature that we've been 
pretty much around the world. Um, and and I think I think this idea of of leading from the future of future back thinking and approach um, this pandemic makes this work I think even more uh, compelling and clear. And and I'm you know excited to see institutions hopefully embrace this way of thinking. And like I said, it's not just business, but we talk about, you know, leaders burning the furniture to heat their homes, right? That they, they're they so stuck in the short term um, and it's only getting worse as the complexity of things just becomes greater. But if they can spend time, you know, setting further out uh, the things that could face nations and the world. I mean, the other big one is global warming. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, that... It, it, at least in the United States, maybe less so in other places. And under this government, we we are very, very present for it. We're very transactional. You know, it's all about um, you know what can we do to boost the economy now. Um, you know, global warming seems so far out uh, in terms of its impact that uh, there's not a lot of looking out thirty years and working backwards about exactly what should be done today and five years from now and so forth to make an impact. So I see these things as major threats, but also opportunities. And, you know, just as we describe in the book, um, unless you spend time out five, 10, or maybe more years, uh, you oftentimes don't see completely the opportunities and the threats had you spent time there. And, and more importantly is the implications and what to do about it. So, so I take some of these major uh, literal disruptions like pandemics and future disruptions like with global warming as, you know, case study number one and number two, yeah. uh, what you can do today, uh, but don't do today in, in reaction, plan out and say, how do you shape that future? How do you anticipate it? And then what are the things you would do today working towards how you'd want to be better in the future about managing future pandemics. Absolutely. Even though the, the crisis uh, is a terrible situation for many companies, it, it can also serve as the catalyst for the change that we really need to need to make going forward. Then there's an old saying on, don't let a good crisis go to waste. <laughs> yeah, so. No, exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I think, I think we can, again, in the spirit of learning is on the other side of, or, you know, humility is on the other side of learning and learning is on the other side of innovation. You know, what can we learn after we've gotten past, you know, all the immediate steps we have to do to, to try to, as we've been calling it here, in the United States flatten the curve of mm -hmm. the, you know, the spike of, of, of those that are infected with coronavirus. So our, COVID-19 is when things at some point settle down and they, and they will, you know, what can we learn from this? How could we be better next time to um, anticipate and to be more future oriented towards things that can, um, that can really hurt us um, or that can really be opportunities and be able to, to have more, things in place um, to prepare for those future unseen events. Um, before we close up, um, would you have any other recommendations or closing thoughts for our listeners um, who are looking to make more innovation happen in their own organizations? Um, well, again, I, I would just like to, because it's just so important, worth repeating, which is um, if you're, if you're looking to make, Innovation happen in a sense, not just incremental, but to really drive, you know, new market creating innovation um, to be able to get your organization uh, to continue to drive the core as much as you can, but to be able to get beyond the core, then um, I just, uh, I just encourage the, uh, if you will, the open mindedness and the faith that the five year to 10 year horizon is, is eminently manageable um, and that it can create incredible insights that lead to, to choices that 
you would make today that otherwise you wouldn't be aware to make or wouldn't have the same commitment behind if you didn't have this long-term view. So I just encourage to literally, you know, try to drive, um, cajole, <laughs> give language <laughs> about, about the five to 10 year horizon. And, um, you know, again, we talk about this in the book. I mean, software companies that are moving super fast, maybe their horizon that super stretch is three to 10 or three to five. And, you know, longer term companies that are, you know, that are like in defense or in pharmaceuticals, maybe it's even greater mm -hmm. than five to 10. But the five to 10 is almost like a metaphor for your uncomfortable long term, you know, that kind of stretches you. And I would just encourage your readers to, you know, I would encourage them to read the book, <laughs> Lead from the Future, <laughs> to give them a language and approach, yeah. but then yeah. try to embed that in their organization that this longer term planning horizon is essential, especially and somewhat counterintuitively as things get moving even faster and there's more noise in the here and now, the more important it is to carve out time and embrace this longer term horizon and really, and really plan for it. Um, you know, just again, as we're experiencing today with this uh, current crisis around the world. Fully agree. Uh, and uh, the book is a great read. So I would recommend all of our listeners to, to pick that up. Um, should be uh, available uh, next month. Yes, it's, uh, it's scheduled for April 14th. And uh, as we speak, just like so many things, I mean, it's possible that the, uh, the, the, the time when it goes on bookshelves or on Amazon might be delayed a month uh, to May, but uh, yeah. <laughs> we're taking this one day at a time. But uh, <laughs> let's just say within the next couple months. Uh, Great. Thanks again for your time, Mark. It's been a real pleasure. Um, I wish you and uh, the new book all the success you deserve. Well, thank you, Jesse. It's been uh, my honor to be on your show.